Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Xiao Chan, for the uh, <coughs> keynote address and making some very good points related to current state of supply chain management. Right, today we have three we have three panel sessions going on until this afternoon, and the first of these is going to take place right now. And the title of this: Risk and Reward: Designing Supply Chain Ecosystems for Success. To moderate this panel, I'm delighted to welcome um, Dr. Christopher Holmes and Christopher or Chris, as, he, as, he's, as he's better known, is the Managed Director at IDC Asia Pacific. And if you have attended Logisim in previous years, you'll know that Chris is a, a, is a regular face and feature of these events. So, uh, Dr. Christopher Holmes, can I ask you to come up to the stage and welcome the rest of your panel? Thank you. Good morning, everybody, and thank you very much, Bob, for that kind introduction. So I'd like to invite my panelists to come up on stage. Um, so uh, Mark, Indranil, and Raymond, if you could just make your way to the stage, please. I'll be on video. Raymond. I think we're just we're short of panelists. I'm on. Well, bearing in mind, you just sneezed a far, far away from me as possible. <laughs> ah. Engineer, are you doing as uh, virtually? Yes, that's right. Can we get the sound on? Can you not hear me? We can now. Welcome, okay. sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. OK. I'm not sure what happened to Mark. So um, let's. Uh, uh, Let's um, get going on to this uh, panel conversation. And I think it was a very interesting topic area, um, looking at risk and reward, designing supply chain ecosystems for success. I mean, if I go back five, six years ago, the topic would have been designing supply chains for success. We've added the word ecosystems. And I think there still needs to be some understanding as to what we actually mean by that and really what's different so maybe raymond i'd like to sort of um, invite your comments first on what's different about a supply chain ecosystem versus our traditional supply chain what's new well i think it's not so much new chris as at all uh, what's evolved or what's come to the fore in the last 18 or 24 months right um we used to talk a lot about um, this ecosystems and everything being um, interrelated but now I think we've had to actually act on it. Why? Because with all the disruptions um, to, to prevent things like the bullwhip effect to ensure that continuity of supply. So you've actually had to have that relationships with your suppliers, with your uh, vendors, and also very much so within your organization, uh, talking to your different discrete functions within the organization and removing those silos that exist. So it's not so much new, but it's brought it to the fore and enabled more of this happening. So can I just pick up on the comment you made there about interaction? Because again, I mean, we've always had transactions, but ecosystems sort of seem to go a little bit beyond that. Yes. So, um, you know, where you normally have a hands-off relationship with your supplier, we can't share this information with them because it's a, a trade secret, for example. You don't want them to know what what your customers are telling you because you're concerned about sharing that information upstream um, and them sharing it with stakeholders that should not perhaps know this information. But what we've had to, you know, with the immediate lockdown that happened with COVID, for example, um, you have all these Zoom calls and you have to start communicating and everyone's questioning what's going to happen next. What does that next, what does that future, that short term future look like? Um, it's no longer talking about what your forecast is for 2022, but what's your forecast now in this quarter and how are we going to meet the demand? How are we going to move inventory around? How are we going to have um, raw materials and facilities and equipment to manufacture and push that out to our customers and their customers? So that communication. Fantastic. So, Indranil, I'd like to bring you in onto this conversation sure. again. I'd, I'd be interested to get the, you know, your view on this sort of, you know, what's different about this ecosystem compared to sure. that, uh, traditional supply chain. Sure, sure, Chris. Can I can I uh, get your permission to put on a slide? Yes. 
uh, because I think this is probably relevant. Let me know if you can see my slide. Can you? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, let me get this. Sorry about the technology. Uh, <laughs> It's on the way. There was a traffic jam this morning on the PIE. <laughs> it's on the PIE, the slide. Okay, here we go. Okay, here we go. So I, I think uh, I'll, I'll try and answer this question in a couple of parts. And first is that, I mean, the whole uh, supply chains are, uh, I mean, going to be configured to be asset light models. I mean, uh, to, and, and the second thing, of course, they are going to be much more responsive to customer needs than they have been in the past. So, so there are there are two things happening. One is organizations are trying to be asset light as we move along. And obviously at the same time, wanting to be much more responsive to customer needs. So there are, therefore what is happening is what we are starting to see is shared assets. Uh, people are not putting everything into their own assets. So that's where the 3PL players and you know the, the Ubers and Grabs and, and Uber Freight comes into play. Then the emergence of platforms. I mean, now technology has moved to a point where it is possible to you know, you use that te technology on platforms to be able to work with your partners or with your ecosystem, if I may call it. And of course, uh, you know, as Raymond was suggesting, it is no longer a pure transaction-based relationships, but I think we are starting to see a lot of partnerships forming where, uh, you know, I mean, the, 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 the level of uh, integration is becoming higher. Uh, now, all of this, of course, as I mentioned, is being to a large extent, uh, you know, supported by technology. Now, just not not just platforms, but whether it is cloud, uh, whether it is you know analytics, whether it is even three D printing for spares, for example, uh, IoT, augmented reality. So, so there's a lot of technology which is kind of supporting this uh, small piece of own network that clients have today. Uh, and, and then this own network is then supported through this technology with a flexible asset light network. And, and I, I, I stress on the word network. And this network then comprises of last mile fulfillment. Uh, in Europe, there's a whole lot of happening on recycling platforms, reverse logistics, uh, buyer networks, uh, shared manufacturing plat network platforms, 3D on-demand 3D printing, uh, crowdsource delivery, which we talked of, you know, Uber Freight and so on. And and, and, and even ocean and uh, air freight forwarding platforms are becoming more integrated with your own systems. And of course, warehouses. So so so, so I think to, to, to answer your question, Chris, uh, one is the whole drive towards asset light, two being more responsive to customers. And this is all being enabled through technology and obviously as a cons and 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 of course much deeper relationship with your ecosystem or what what we are referring here as partnerships um, i hope that answers your question chris no, that's that's great and let me um stick with you and Janil, because again i mean i think one of the things that i mean we've seen in our research is most of this drive towards this new way of thinking this this ecosystem approach has yeah. been driven by the consumer I think mm -hmm. I was talking with someone earlier on and they were saying that, you know, once the consumer has experienced, the customer has experienced um, one omni-channel experience where they've managed to buy a product online and return it to a physical store, they mm -hmm. expect that from everybody. And in order to actually move forward with that, I mean, yeah. are, you, are you seeing that this is really where the ecosystem comes to the fore? It's really being driven by that customer? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as I said, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, the starting point is the customer. Uh, their expectations, their demands are changing. And uh, as you said, as they experience a better service, faster service, more uh, omni-channel service, that's the expectation they have from every, uh, uh, you know, every product uh, that they're buying, every service they're receiving. And, and consequently, what happens is if any organization has to do it themselves, it would be virtually impossible. The investments they have to make into those capabilities will, will simply not be viable. And, uh, and, and until and unless these capabilities are on a shared platform. And, and that's 
the reason why you are starting to see companies trying to meet that consumer need at the same time being asset light in delivering those uh, expectations of the consumer. Consumer totally on on aligned with you on that, Chris. Fantastic, fantastic. So let me just switch the question back to Raymond now. I mean, because we wanted to first of all cover sort of talking about you know what is an ecosystem and. I then want to get into designing an ecosystem, so actually putting in place the building blocks, and we've got some nice um, segues from, you know, particularly coming about the, the platform. But let me just put it to you, Raymond. <laughs> Mark, welcome. I was Better say, late than never. <laughs> I would have said just in time, but actually not. <laughs> Please join us. Yeah, JTL, wasn't it? Just too late. <laughs> You're allowed to remove your mask, Mark. Oh, no, that's okay. <laughs> okay. So, in fact, as you've just arrived, let me throw you a nice question just to get going. <laughs> what, does, what is success in an ecosystem? What does it look like? Um, so, success for me um, is... So I, I always have a phrase that I use. It's called Q plus S plus R plus F equals P4. Quality, service, risk, flexibility equals performance, price, profit, and people. The ecosystem in any supply chain has to have every single element of that. And the world is changing and I don't know if you've talked about it yet, but the world for me is changing. Um, I work within a supply chain for procurement and sustainability, and that will drive the future for me. And it will drive the future for most uh, supply chains going forward. And that ecosystem has to be uh, both resilient to the change in life. Um, when I say life, it's because we have to change the world and that's uh, demanded on uh, supply chains. And uh, in, in that way, if you put all those factors together, that will be the ecosystem in the future. Small companies helping larger companies become successful. Okay, fantastic, thank you. So let's get on to talking about designing the ecosystem. So Raymond, let me throw this to you. I mean, because a lot of the supply chains, you know, we know of old, they sort of grew up organically, you know, as needs came about. And then we started to get into this, this era of starting to sort of do that development, that design, that forward thinking. I mean, as we move into this era of ecosystems, how do you go about designing that? And again, building on what Mark was just talking about, about bringing in all those aspects, particularly the newer ones around sustainability that we're seeing a lot of interest in, in terms of... Um, you know, and that becoming core in terms of being able to report back through tier N across that supply chain. How do you get going on this? Well, I think the, 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 the answer that we would all like to hear is that it's driven by the customer. There's a lot of forward planning um, and consideration that goes into the process. Unfortunately, I think a lot of it is actually derived not so much out of customer needs or wants, um, but more around how do you actually keep your business running, right? Um, so, and in many organizations, especially when you talk about supply chains, they actually do not even interface or interact with their customers. They're hidden somewhere within an organization um, and they probably wouldn't know a customer if they tripped over one, you know? So um, I think it's actually driven out more by need rather than out of planning. So, you know, I've got, sales numbers to deliver in Q4. I've got um, demand that's driven or that I'm told is needed by the business. I've acquired a company that now needs to be integrated. This company that I've acquired, their supply chain needs to be integrated with mine. So it's actually more out of the signals that you get, but very reactive rather than proactive. Uh, that's, the most, that's more of what we see in what we do um, with the society. So, you know, you could have that top 5% or 10% of companies that plan well, have this forecast, have this vision, um, have this mindset. But I would say the large majority actually are more reactive. 
So, and I, I can see Mark smiling there. And I'm not yeah, I'm sure. going to challenge you on that one as yeah. well, because yeah. you're coming from a very traditional, you know, we've been around for 100 years and we've always done it like this. Because we are starting to see these new entrants start to come in and they're actually born in the ecosystem. They're born in the cloud. You know, that's the way they currently exist. That's the way they've actually been developed. They don't plan on owning a lot of these things. You know, everything's going to be networked through the platform. And I think there's... I think there's a disruption happening there. Mark, you're looking very keen to say something. No, I, I totally agree. <laughs> um, we're, we're in it for the profit if you're looking at big corporations. Yeah. And, and that's how people drive it today. Uh, volatility is one thing. Um, the market is changing. We, um, a company that I used to work for changed our, um, our planning every 14 days, depending on what the market said. Okay. Instead of future planning in correct, uh, incorrect ways. Andrew Nils, come on. Uh, are you on my side here? Or are you on the, uh... No. So, so, so let let I, I'm on both sides actually. Let me <laughs> let me actually uh, share uh, my screen again, if you don't mind. And I have some interesting statistics to share on this. So, so let's start off with. Uh, Mark's point about, you know, customers are driving things. And, and that's, I mean, given, uh, you know, customers are becoming undisputed centers of attraction, of attention. And 45% of customers we execute out of 600 companies that we spoke to uh, after COVID started uh, are talking about, you know, a customer expectations impacting business by 2025, et cetera, et cetera. And 79% of these supply chain executives believe that customer networks, uh, customer expectations demand a flexible network. That is where your asset light, uh, you know, ecosystem comes into play. But to, to Raymond's point, actually, the fact is, while they all talk about it, uh, more than 71% of the companies that we spoke to uh, do not have business operations contingency plans. Uh, typically, the ones they had, had contingency planned for disruptions for only 14 days. Uh, not for extended disruptions like the ones we supposed uh, at COVID brought in. So to, to the point that, you know, I mean, uh, uh, Raymond was ma making, it is true, uh, you, you, uh, you know, uh, that, uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, while, you know, everybody professes the need for, ex you know, long-term planning, the fact that consumers are driving change and we need to be there, you know, to make that change and plan ahead. The fact is that most of them, did not do so till the uh, you know I mean uh, till till the COVID hit us and as I said contingency plans didn't exist in 71 percent of the companies we spoke to and where it did and supply chain contingency I'm talking of and where it did it had maximum 14 days uh, you know uh, contingency taken you know uh, disruption take accounted for so so I'm, I'm I'm technically on both sides you know while everybody says you need to do this but the fact is they haven't been doing it in the past okay okay so again let's let's get back into this area of sort of designing the ecosystem and starting to think about those key areas to actually consider i mean you brought up the area around platforms and sort of starting to share data share applications and again that's one of the things we're seeing has been very key in moving forward with this ecosystem I mean, maybe you could just sort of um, uh, uh, share with us what you're seeing as to how people are actually, as I say, maybe shifting towards this as we sort of start to move, you know, into whatever it, the, the next normal, whatever you want to call it. Um, maybe you could just share what you're seeing in terms of this sort of shift to these platforms. So you want me to start with it? Okay, sure. Um, yes, so, so, okay. Uh, so let, let me... Uh, I, I think I, I had a whole presentation, so let me try and use some of it uh, to kind of uh, explain the point. Uh, so this is uh, this is one of the advantages of coming in virtually. You can correct. actually share the slides <laughs> as opposed to those on stage. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, I'm taking full advantage of that. Uh, so, so we talked about the ecosystem here, and I think where I'll take an example. So this is an example actually of a, of a global beauty major who embarked on this journey to have an asset light model. Uh, and interestingly, you know, I mean, and I think one of the points which you will touch upon, which I'll touch now since it is on the slide, is about the fact that they, they, these are partnerships and you cannot be without a partnership and, uh, and you cannot achieve your goals without a partnership. And this uh, particular client wanted to improve the uh, 
the the speed or turnaround times of their uh, you know supply chain and they they looked at you know lack of automation in the dcs which were obviously with 3pls as a big challenge and uh, and and obviously they were finding it uh, you know difficult to convince the 3pls to put in their um, uh, you know their uh, you know automate their dcs and put in better supply chain planning tools etc so so they uh, in in the in 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 a kind of in, in given the partnership that we talked of what they did is they did two things once one they basically tendered for new dcs with automation but with a longer period of contract so so they were kind of rewarding uh, the people who were willing to put in uh, automation with a longer term contract they basically moved from a typical 1 to 2 year contract to a 5 year contract in a post this and uh, and and of of course then they came into the whole question of uh, the 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 platforms they deployed now this is the one that uh, you know i mean i kind of picked up from them uh, and and uh, and and basically they they actually and this is a very comprehensive example which is why i picked it up so so they basically had four broad areas where they brought in uh, platforms uh, one was on the sourcing side which was about procurement uh the other was on the logistic side which are in terms of uh, freight information uh, network cost savings uh, visibility so there were control towers in it and uh, you know real time configuration capacity alerts etc cetera, etc cetera. so they had a sourcing platform they had a logistics platform they also put in an integrated planning platform and when i say integrated what i mean is these planning platforms were not purely internal to the company but extended out to the partners that you know we talked of earlier across the entire supply chain and then of course they had to link that with their uh, internal manufacturing platform which they put in which was again in so into some extent uh, 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 again integrated with the ecosystem of uh, part suppliers uh, or, or or product suppliers like packaging etc and obviously a lot of this was essentially um, you know i mean supported by technology which included ai ml mobile capabilities uh, you know telematics cloud etc and uh, they put in uh, put in a, a whole lot of uh, you know i mean capabilities in terms of people as well to manage these platforms and these ecosystems so you know coming back to the the the, the example that i was taking uh, uh, i mean they, they, as a consequence of what happened they actually achieved a 25 to 30% reduction in logistics cost in a span of about 24 months and which of course they managed to retain so 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 whole uh, i mean taking your ecosystem uh, and taking your logistics operation making it into taking it out to the ecosystem partnering with your ecosystem to ensure that they see value in putting up for example in this case automation Uh, and 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 they don't see it as a cost which is being burdened on them by simply by their customers and and therefore they participate more actively this company did achieve a huge 25 to 30% saving in logistics costs so i, I didn't answer your question straight up uh, uh, you know i mean uh, chris but uh, i hope this kind of covers what you were looking for now that's great that's great thank you for sharing that and actually i mean i, I want to pass it over to raymond now because Engineer brings up a couple of really good points there, particularly around this this sharing in terms of that that um, integrated planning. I mean, because one of the things we see around this ecosystem is much more around that sharing of data, sharing of information, and then pushing and as I say going down from just the next tier down, but through the whole ecosystem, which again is what the platforms allow us to actually do. I mean, is that something that you're you're considering in your in your own organization or have you seen it with other organizations um the, sh the short answer is yes um i think there's also because there is a uh, increase in the sort of platforms that you see coming being available in the marketplace and the cost of actually being on a platform the so the short answer is yes that the question though we ask often ask is are we coming back to that, to that whole reactionary mindset right when you talk about logistics cost for example freight rates or warehousing cost and going into um i think indrinal said earlier um a longer contract period um but is that being driven by increased cost therefore you need to offset the roi 
you know, so instead of having a three-year contract, you go into a five-year contract. Um, and secondly, for example, when you're talking about freight, is it reacting because there's no capacity out there in the market? You're desperate for capacity. You're going to be grasping at straws and trying out any new platform that comes online uh, to try and mitigate that cost increase. So um, I think Indranil said that this company managed to achieve lower logistics costs, 25 to 30% over X period. I'm wondering though, is it because you're comparing your cost with between say 20 to 21 versus 2021 20, cost to 2019? Because if you've got a company that says that they're paying less for their freight and their warehousing and the logistics overall, um, in 2021 over 2019 or 2018, I'd be a bit surprised. Um, I speak to a lot of VPs who say that, yes, that's what they're doing. But then when you actually start scratching the surface, that's not really the case. Um, so, but yes, the, the short answer is yes, we're seeing more of these platforms, more collaboration taking place. But I think it's driven more through the need of having to do this rather than the want to have to do this. And people have got short memories. I'm just wondering, after we're out of COVID, you know, um, we've always had black swan events in supply chains. Then people talk about business continuity planning, backup scenarios. And then when things revert back to that next normal or the better normal, people have short-term memories. And then they live quarter to quarter and have to go back to Wall Street and report, um, you know, um, good earnings and um, nice results. And then they throw everything that they've done, or not everything, but a lot of what they've done because they've had to react out. So call me cynical, but um, I'm, I, you know, I'm just wondering. I'll call you cynical. Mark. It, it, it's a human effect. It, it is the human effect. Uh, we're, we're in a pandemic right now, right? And we all are living it. And then when it's gone, we forget it. And we'll, we'll go, remember the day? And, and that's what everybody does. And, and businesses do that as well. Um, but no matter what, uh, aggregated supply is, is, of course, something that you should be talking about now. Uh, I remember when the pandemic came out and there was 100 people up in China that were hit. And somebody told me, I don't name names, but uh, we shouldn't work. 14 days later, China was closed and all components were locked in um, behind some walls. And, and we couldn't get in. So, so again, risk is is key factor in any buildup in any platform. So let, let, let me pull it back again, because we, we, we're trying to talk about this designing for ecosystem. And I think Indranil made some good points about partnerships. You know, and again, I can remember being on the Logisim stage 10 years ago, talking about supply chain collaboration, because everyone was talking about it. And finally, we asked the question, what does collaboration actually mean? And it was doing more for me, doing more for free. You know, that's what the expectation was. So partnerships, you know, are we seeing a, a change in terms of how we actually think about partnerships? And again, you know, some of the some of the work we've been doing, we're starting to see across the ecosystem, there's more of a, if the ecosystem wins, everybody wins, more of that sort of shared benefit coming out from when that customer makes the sale, some of that benefit flows across the entire ecosystem, rather than our traditional transactional approach. Mark, you're shaking your head. I, I think it's the big players that, that use the word collaboration wrongly. <laughs> uh, definitely. Um, you know, uh, it's a selling mechanism saying we'll collaborate. Yeah. We'll get the suppliers to collaborate. We'll put this system in the platform and we'll make the make sure that we uh, can control that. And and it, it really forces people to uh, work in a way that they don't. Yeah. Uh, smaller companies will not work that way. What about going forward? I mean, we, as I say, we seem to be moving from collaboration now to partnerships. Is part, do you see partnerships being any other different way? No, it's it's. We'll find a new word to use. <laughs> uh, it, it's a buzzword for me. Yeah. Uh, partnerships is is clearly a better word than collaboration. Um, but but the issue is, going forward. They, they didn't like what I said about them. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> turned off my mic for that one. Um, but, but no, uh, going forward, we have to think about, the uh, again, the world is changing. Mm -hmm. the, how we work together is changing. Partnerships is the right word to use, but it has to be the right level of companies that use that word. 
I mean, it's not the big mastodon working with the big mastodon to be a partner because that, that will ruin the whole ecosystem for everybody. That, that's, that's my issue as a small business owner, that if, if they get all the ideas, they put them into one big ecosystem and own that platform. Because they will go in, if you look at an, an ecosystem or a supply chain today, there's a customer side, there's a there's the internal, the external, and everything, and they will want a piece of every single pie. And they shouldn't be given that uh, that that the right to do that. Because there's so many businesses out there that are 10 times better and more collaborative because they'll go that longer mile. That's why my, my phrase, the Q plus S plus R plus F, the flexibility of change, that's a key factor for everybody going forward. Flexibility. Flexibility. So that actually starts to get into a very interesting conversation then because, again, we're talking about this design for the ecosystem. So what about thinking around almost that common purpose of the ecosystem or, I mean, and also within the existing organizations, I mean, is ecosystem just another word for sort of supply chain? Is it just another word for, or is it, or is it something different? Are we seeing heads of ecosystem design start to come to the fore? I know Indra Nils, I think, dropped off a technology challenge. So uh, Raymond, I mean, what's your view on this? I think there are shoots of it. Um, um, and maybe we need Indranil on this panel to counter us a bit. I'm, but, I'm uh, here. I'm here. Only thing is my camera seems to have stopped working. Ah, fantastic. <laughs> Thanks for speaking up, Indranil. Yeah. So uh, I think there are shoots of it. Uh, but it's, you know, uh, a new word on a old practice or an old way of thinking. Um, it's evolving. So, but it's not happening as fast as we would need it to be because also being mindful, finding that right partner to develop that ecosystem is very, very challenging. Um, I mean, even if you talk about something that's like even this event, finding the right partners and the people to work with and the right team to get them all thinking along the same way and contributing um, and you heard Bob and Stephanie both say it earlier. Most of us are volunteers. So everyone comes to the platform with their own agenda. Um, most of it positive, but getting all of us to think that same way and deliver and actually be here today on the 23rd of November um, is actually quite a challenge. Um, not just for Mark, but, but for everyone, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there are shoots of it happening but finding that right partnership and developing it is very very challenging because also let's not forget people come and go a lot of ideas um, a lot of direction are set by individuals within an organization either by the boss or by um, what stephanie used to call a fox you know someone within the organization with a lit with a little with quite a fair bit of influence driving this development, but he or she might leave um, and then that idea leaves with him or her. So, and then a new person comes in with that idea. So having that continuity in that mindset and that purpose to develop those partnerships, that's also a challenge. And again, you're talking about partnerships rather than just a pure transactional. No, absolutely. If it's transactional, it's easy, right? It's, um, it's um, sometimes I use this analogy when I talk about freight and warehousing. With a freight forwarder who's handling your shipments, if that company messes up, it's quite easy that the next shipment, you just stop using that company ABC and give it to XYZ. But if, you're, if you've got a company running your distribution center or one of your warehouses, that's a fairly long-term partnership. It's three or five years. Um, so, but even on the freight perspective, you do want to actually develop those partnerships, people that you can trust. So yeah. Indra, no, we can't see you, but um, I assume you can hear us. I mean, yes. in terms of sort of talking about that, that, that idea around, you know, um, structures changing within organizations to actually design these ecosystems. I mean, are you, are you seeing any evidence of that at the moment or are you hearing any conversations around that? Uh, yeah, I mean, look, uh, I, I, I tend to agree with Raymond on the point that partnerships are not easy to build. 
uh, and they take time and they take, and they need continuity. You can't build a partnership today, uh, you know, and then next morning you you change all the terms and conditions because a new guy came in. And it is likely to happen. I would say uh, it does happen more often than we would want to, uh, you know, uh, agree to. Uh, so 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 that point is valid. But I think, as uh, Raymond also said, that uh, this is starting to happen. And as the supply chains become more complicated, as customer demands uh, need uh, you know, investments, which one single company are, will be unable to make, particularly when we are talking omnichannel, uh, I think it, it, is, it is becoming an imperative for companies to develop these uh, ecosystem partnership to be able to serve the customer at a at a cost and investment which is financially uh, feasible. Uh, so, so, so to that extent, uh, I think the eco, the environment is is headed in a direction where uh, you know companies, they like it or not, uh, have to embark on this uh, journey to build partnerships through, with the ecosystem. Uh, has it happened? I think it has happened only in pockets. Uh, there are some some companies, like for example, uh, e-commerce companies today. Uh, given the how how things are moving very fast for them, capacity is impossible to build for them in you know whether it is in fulfillment centers, whether it is in last mile delivery, and clearly they are heavily dependent on their partnerships. Uh, without naming, I mean, one of the large uh, e-commerce players in Singapore. Uh, their biggest complaint has been the lack of drivers, which even though they have their own vehicles, this can't seem to find drivers to go and deliver. And uh, and they are therefore starting, I mean, to depend heavily on ecosystem partners rather than uh, on their own fleet, which is what they had started out with. Uh, so so clearly, I mean, uh, the, the, the two things, uh, consumer pressure and the financial uh, viability of, you know, getting into everything yourself, uh, is going to push uh, players to go into these kind of longer term partnership because these partnerships uh, uh, will need investments and which the partner can potentially make bet better because of the shared uh, client base that they will have. So, so, so that direction that that movement has started. Is it a something that is at you know at, at full speed? No, it is very slow. It is in pockets. Uh, and particularly in industries which are facing this pressure more than others, so so it will be a mat it, It's a question of time uh, before it kind of starts uh, hitting other industries. But I think the the train has left the station. It is moving in that direction, and uh, you know everybody has will eventually fall in line. And and I think uh, you know these one-sided contracts. You know where I want to get the cheapest cost. I don't care if the uh, the partner is making money or not. Uh, is not going to last for very long, even if there are people who think that way you, even today. So, I mean, with, with that in mind, I mean, what are you actually seeing that's different in organizations today in terms of actually managing that ecosystem? I mean, how, how are they operating differently? Uh, I, I think the first and foremost difference that I see in companies who are effectively, uh, you know, I mean, able to create uh, good partnerships is a is a concept of shared value that means it is not about me making all the profits but how do i work with my partners so that the total value we generate maximizes and that value is shared fairly i think until and unless uh, you know that thinking comes into play and you know you will not succeed in partnerships uh, and i think there are a few companies who are doing a great job at that but as i said you know it, it's few as of today Thanks. Thanks. So as we are now moving into this, as, 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 as has been said, the train has left the station. We are on this shift towards this ecosystem supply chain, and we are starting to see it start to um, really take hold. What are you seeing as to how organizations are to keep that ecosystem alive? We've talked a lot more about partnership, a lot more about sharing data. Um, sharing information. Mark, what are you seeing that people are actually doing to really sort of, I suppose, almost ensure that effective communication, as the minister said earlier on? I mean, how are they How are they really engaging and keeping that ecosystem alive and making sure it's operating effectively? There you go. Hello. Um, 
So how they're keeping it alive or yeah. where are they moving to? Well, how are they keeping it alive and how are you actually then looking to optimize and move forward with it? Because there's obviously going to be continuous improvement. I think most of the companies are still looking at their technology stack. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think there's, uh, again, going back to a lot of buzzwords and, and uh, a lot of internal uh, fighting. And the reason for internal fighting is uh, it's a pandemic and they want to keep their job, <clears throat> to, to be fair on that one. And that means they will extend their workload to find a better collaboration internally to stay compared to making it work for the company that they're working for. Uh, it's my own opinion, I know, and it's sometimes hard, and I'll take the discussion if anybody wants to have that discussion afterwards. But I really think that companies are, are working collaboratively internally, but they are moving too slow for what's changing in the market today. Um, uh, again, um, I, I want to comment on before, there's few companies that will do this today. They will move quicker and, and get into that market uh, quicker. Uh, we all know that consumers will change brands if a brand is more sustainable. 74% of consumers will do that. So supply chains need to understand that to build the right supply chain suppliers up to deliver that to get more quicker to market and that is how ecosystems should be built up so the, the design of that is for the customer and consumer not internally the consumer drives the internal change but that's always been i mean one of the conversations i've had with many people down the supply chain i'm three steps away from that end customer how how do I influence, how do I connect with him? I mean, that's always a question that always comes up. Yeah, but it always comes up because we go back. Um, I, I, we all remember the 80s, uh, most of us at least, um, hopefully. Um, so in the 80s, what did we do? We did bespoke systems all around the world. We were bespoking for our, for our company. We were getting that in, and then some mastodon said, you know what, I'll standardize everything and I'll put it in and everybody cheered, and everybody loved it. Then they implemented it, and they said, oh, sorry, pardon my French, damn, we're caught. We can't change, we're not flexible enough anymore. Now, okay, we'll have to stay with them because now we're using too much money. It'll cost too much to change. And, and that investment is not good because our profits will go down and we'll have to give that to the consumer and so on. So it all comes around one more time. If you look at the ecosystem change in supply chain, we're going back to the 80s. It will not be bespoke. It will be on standard platform systems, but it will be small, minor companies that have niche products that will bring the larger Mastodon production environment to the best level possible. So it will be a lot of change in that one. Chris, just to add, if I may, I'm also wondering, right, or for what I see, there's also a lot of confusion. A lot of people that we interact with at the logistics society, they're not sure what to do. So they want to adopt this change, but we're also bombarded with a lot of information. Um, and especially in the last two years, there's so many webinars and um, online platforms and conferences. So you're bombarded with this information. You've got to deliver on your supply chain anyway in your work. So um, and I want to do better. There is that desire, I think, in most people to want to do better, but I'm actually not sure what to do, and can I influence that? So there's also that level of ignorance, not in the negative sense, uh, but in the sense of, I know something needs to be done, but I'm not quite sure what. And um, should I take that risk and stick my neck on the chopping block and take this direction? and then risk failure and humiliation and you know being outcast live in a desert island um, or what have you but so there's also that that hesitancy coupled to that ignorance but still wanting to do better and us being locked up in our homes not being able to interact at platforms like this and argue and disagree and have a drink later as well um that hasn't helped it so you know you're you're, you're in the zoom call world you're not interacting with anyone so you become almost myopic as well in your outlook because 
the interaction isn't the same as being in the same room with someone. Like, just for everyone's information, we've never met before. Um, so, you know, um, it's not that we conspired to agree on what we were going to say, but um, this interaction helps, you know, and starts um, stimulating that thinking um, or not agreeing. But there is that ignorance and there's that people have been removed from being able to do these things. Thank you, Raymond. And in fact, that's a lovely segue into the last three minutes of this where I've got something written down on my question sheet called guidance. What guidance do you have in terms of designing and developing the ecosystem going forward? And obviously, I will give you the first one, which is to attend more events like this. Logisim. <laughs> um, but again, you know, as a, as a party comment, you said people are unsure what to do. They don't know what to do next. I mean, what advice would you give them? And I'll start with you, Raymond. Keep pushing that envelope. Um, keep coming and thinking of new ways to do it. Um, you know, I mean, what do you really have to lose? You know, aside from your job. But, <laughs> but keep pushing that envelope, you know, um, and be open to new ideas rather than um, thinking... And some of the people in this room will know, I've, you know, those who know me, I keep asking them about certain solutions that I see every day. And I keep asking them, is this the future of how supply chains and ecosystems will develop? Because, you know, we're being bombarded or confronted with new ways of doing things. And, you know, those of us that were working in the, seven, the, the 80s and the 90s and the 20s or, or the knots, um, have a lot of baggage that we brought with us, you know. So keep pushing that envelope and being open to new ideas. Thank you. Indranil, let me call on you. What guidance would you have? Yep. Uh, so, so I mean, to, I, I mean, to Raymond's point, uh, I started working in the mid-80s, and it's been more than 37 years. But uh, I have reinvented myself in the last five or six or seven years by actually attending courses on artificial intelligence, on blockchain, uh, and, and, and kind of seeing what's happening uh, around us, what is driving that change around us. And I think that, uh, that I mean, I would strongly recommend people who you know, are looking at it from an individual as well as from a corporate point of view is keep, keep, keep abreast of what is happening. You know, make sure that, uh, you know, you are not... Uh, staying where you are, but you're upskilling yourself, you're aware of what's happening. Even if you don't use any of that, be aware of what is possible. So that's one. Uh, second is uh, around the fact that uh, I think if you do embark on this journey, uh, set yourself a North Star. And this North Star doesn't have to be tomorrow. It could be five years down the road. But knowing what is around me, this is where I think I should be in five years' time. And then start small. Pick up one small area, uh, you know, and and make a success of it. Prove that the value there is value in doing what you're doing, and once you're satisfied with that, then scale up. I think uh, I, I think a massive jump into you know completely reinventing an organization or a supply chain is not the best way to go of it. Go at it, uh, but rather uh, set yourself a north star. Uh, start small, prove uh, the value. And, and then only scale up. I, I think those would be my two pieces of advice. Thanks, Ingenieur. And uh, Mark? Uh, yeah, uh, don't use the word transformation at any point in time. Uh, transformation is just a, yeah, it's a in, in the way it's change and we have to just get used to change. The transformation is, is so big, you can't see it for, for bare of trees. Um, I, I will say one thing. Um, I'm, I'm ex-military. And when, when, when you do that, you set a goal. There's a target. I, I think it's really, really looking at how corporate businesses do it today. They always have a five-year plan. They set that goal in five years. They never look beyond the first year because then it changes. Now set that goal of a five-year plan and go get it done. This is, if you cannot do that, you cannot make decisions year on year on year on year. It will change. And that will just bring up your investments quicker. So. Fantastic. Thank you, Mark. So 
That brings us to the end of today's first panel conversation. We've talked around ecosystems, what is an ecosystem, how to think about designing that ecosystem, keeping the ecosystem alive, and then finally some guidance on how to actually move forward. And I think the key takeaway for me is actually don't talk about transformation. It's all around change, change all the time. Update yourself, update your organisation. With that, please put your hands together and thank Indradil, Mark and Raymond for uh, their insights on the panel conversation. Thank you very much. Bob?